I want to welcome you today to the Content Creation Made Easy podcast because you know that for a while now I've been talking about short form content and I'm always talking about how to do things with your content and your copy and your messaging in a non-bullshitty way. And today I want to kind of talk about how to move from short form content and why there's still a place for your longer form content and that we can also do that in a non-bullshitty way. And today I'm talking specifically about email I love email, I use email, I want you to use email. And so today I've literally brought on an email expert who I've been following for a long time. This is Tarzan Kay. I'm really excited that Tarzan is here. So Tarzan is a former copywriter. She was a copywriter for hire. Like she did copywriting for you. And really she totally pivoted her business to really lean into email, making email a viable option to create an incredibly successful business. So. I've taken Tarzan's email courses. I have a lot of her stuff and I know that she's an expert when it comes to this. So that is why I have brought her on here to talk about no bullshit, how to make it more fun, how to do it well, why we should do it. And also kind of getting into some more vulnerable stuff where I want to head at the end. So I want to just say thanks Tarzan for taking time, especially in the middle of your email stars launch to come chat with me about this stuff. Thanks for having me. It's my favorite topic. So let's do it. I figured. Okay. So I think people would really love to understand what made you move away from something as like tried and true as done for you copywriting and really lean so heavily into the email lane. Well, in fact, even when I was in my early days as a copywriter, I was mostly doing email. In my first year in business, I did this email copywriting contest that was just like probably in retrospect, a small time thing, but at the time it felt like a related and I thought, okay, like maybe email could be my specialty. Email could be my thing. So I just started leaning into email and I started really focusing on doing email for my clients. And then at the same time, I was emailing my own list and I just discovered something that I really love doing. Like I, I never, I only added social media many years later and I'm still really spotty, but email just from the beginning was something that felt really in my zone. It felt like it really gives back a lot. It's really an intimate space to talk with subscribers and share ideas. And it feels unlike anything else out there. And um, I've just loved it for a long time. And so eventually I pivoted away from doing email for clients to teaching email to my email subscribers and the audience that I had been growing along the way. What was it when you say it gives back? And I'm just curious what you specifically mean by that, because I have an idea, but I'm wondering what it, what it, what it looks like for you. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just in terms of like a stat that is often thrown around when it comes to email marketing. Um, some people will say, and there are studies to back this up, that for every dollar you spend on email marketing, you can expect an average return on investment of $42. Mm. And email is really like the place where you see, can see consistent, measurable return on investment. So that's one thing. Like the first time I made an offer to my email list, I was so blown away. I was like, whoa, okay. This, I had been nurturing them for a year and I had a list of maybe 700 and some subscribers. And I couldn't believe that they were so interested in buying my offer. I was absolutely blown away. So, um, you know, it gives back in monetary terms, but also um, to me, it's just a much more peaceful space when compared to social media. It feels quieter than like my, you know, my news feed. And I think it gives back in terms of just having really like those intimate conversations, like really it feels like real true relationship building in that oftentimes when I'm selling a program, a lot of the names that I see coming through, I'm like, oh yeah, I recognize those names. Those are people that I've been speaking with, you know, for months, maybe even years. Yeah. So you're saying people reply and respond to your emails. Exactly. Precisely. Yes. Thank you. Yes. So, okay. So tell us, is there because I hear a lot of people complain that their, their lists are really quiet. What is your secret to getting people to reply to you? So my emails, I'm really known for writing emails that are very story driven. And I didn't start out that way. I've just leaned into that over the years. But I've always like my shtick has always been that my emails are fun. They're story driven. And they're also really transparent. Like I from the beginning, I always really shared from where I was at. Like I'm a personal brand. 
And, you know, I had written with my clients, I had written so many emails, like with the rags to riches story. And <laughs> it just felt like a little bit overdone and also just boring. And from the beginning, that's just what felt good to share. And it felt like it was the most interesting to share. Like as I was growing my business, I would bring my subscribers along and I would say like, here's something we tried. This worked, this didn't work. Um, I think it was just a natural evolutionary process. And I think that's really important for all email marketers to know is it takes time for an email newsletter to really take shape. And it's good to think about um, articulating the value of your email and what, but in the beginning, like you're kind of still figuring it out and you do just have to commit to consistency, keep doing it week after week and let those themes and things come, tr come through because in the beginning I couldn't have said like, yes, my emails will be very brave, authentic story driven. And, um, we'll talk about transparency in the industry. Like I did not know that that was years of evolution and it's still continuing to evolve. Um, so, you know, that it was something that gets discovered over time. I think that that's really great because it, it gives people permission and time to figure out what theirs looks like. Like what is your, what is the thing, your, your pillars or what you're leaning on. And I think people are loath to like jump into something because they're like, oh my God, all of these people that I follow are so far ahead of me and everybody's figured it out. And I'm going to look like a fool if I don't have it figured out. So like, this is a big takeaway. Give yourself permission to suck for a little while and like kind of learn as you go, because you don't learn unless you do it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I always say like, I, you know, a large percentage of my emails are pretty average and a small percentage of them are absolutely awesome. And I always, I live by the, the maxim that my best work is ahead of me. So you just have to continue to publish and they'll get better over time. What is average now, um, you know, four years ago was the absolute best I had. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to talk about, because sometimes my clients who are pretty much solopreneurs trying to build an audience, a little bit overwhelmed with content, um, sometimes they are loath to create an email list because it's so much work, or they think that their audience isn't on email or doesn't open email. And then the mm -hmm. other thing I hear pushback on with email is, but everything is short content right now. Everything is like TikTok and Reels and YouTube shorts. And I know that things are getting snackable. So where and how does like is con is is email a content option that is still viable for us? What are your thoughts? Well, you know, the the since I've been in this industry and your people may just be tired of hearing but this, but it remains true, like your email list is the one thing that will always remain yours. And yes, people will come and go. However, when you earn someone's email address, it is not the same as having someone follow you on Instagram. Like as an example, I have, you know, let's say 8,000 Instagram followers. And when I do a story, 500 people maybe see them. Um, that's a pretty low percentage. Whereas if I send an email to my list of 12,000 people, I can be certain that 4,000 of them are going to see that email. Right. So that's a much higher percentage of people that are seeing my content. Plus there are things that I can do um, to, you know, increase my open rate. It's just like, to me, it's a lot more predictable. And also I think it's just important to know, like we need email addresses actually like to function in the world you don't need a social media account. Like if you buy things online, you need an email address. Like you just just sign up for things like to go to school, you must have email. And um, people join my classes all the time that they're like, I can't join your Facebook group. I'm not on Facebook. So like whether you, whatever your feelings are about whether people like it or not, they are actually in their inboxes every single day, multiple times, in some cases, glancing over to it every time it dings. So I think it has at least the same potential, probably more as social media. And one thing that I feel like is really different about email is that you do have like a podcast format, like actually you have time to share an idea 
that is like actually substantial. And I think people want that. Like I am also digesting bite-sized content all the time. I love TikTok. I love Instagram. And also I want something that I can sink my teeth into. And I also want real connection. Like when I really can connect with someone's story and hit reply and have a conversation, it's just very different than what's happening, say in my DMs on Instagram, which is also fun and exciting and nothing against that. I like that. Um, however, it is a unique space that is very different. Um, and also is like serves so many purposes. Like we're talking about, we're just talking about nurturing um, and nurturing mm -hmm. and selling, but we also need to talk about delivering our products and bringing customers back to purchase again. Like email just does so many things for me and my business. Like it is the backbone of everything we do. Like we could cut off all social media tomorrow and we would figure out a way to do it like email is like, it's the spine. We just cannot, we get it. I want, like, I know some people don't do email in the way that we do it. And I wonder to myself, I'm like, well, how do they do it? Like, how do you walk <laughs> without a spine? I don't even understand. I totally feel the same way. It's such a foundation of my content. So mm. when, um, I love that you said the, the, the remark. So two things like I'm taking away from what you just said. One is like email is there and it's showing up in people's inboxes and it's kind of on us to entice them to open up those freaking emails at this point. Like we have to really have great headlines and subject lines and great content. Yeah, I also want to say another stat that gets thrown around a lot is that 49, and this was a recent study in the last couple of years, that 49% of consumers want to receive promotional emails from their favorite brands. And I think like often, especially for people like me who are in business to business and they're on a lot of email lists and they know the space really well, they're like, oh, like, don't people hate this? Like, I'm so annoyed. no. <laughs> They actually don't like there's a very good chance that your customers want to get the emails from you. They actually consented like in in our case, like we don't just have opt ins like you can get almost any opt in that I offer currently. You can get the opt in without joining my email list like we have where we have practiced like a high level of consent, so you have to take a box to say you want to hear from me they actually want to hear from me and i think it can be really surprising like i've noticed this in a lot of my students and email stars that when they really like lean into their own personality and their brand personality and really show up in a way that feels real they will start to see their subscribers responding and saying things like oh my god this is the best thing in my inbox or like oh my god yours are the only emails i ever want to read and that can be really eye-opening is like well yeah um you might think that it's annoying but when you actually really practice this in a different way that feels good to you you're going to find that it's like what people really want more of their inboxes may be crowded but they're not crowded with gold they're like <laughs> you know crowded with right. like shrapnel that they're trying to pick through that's a good point. So when we're talking about all this stuff, um, what are some of the mistakes that like the hot, the, the really low hanging fruit that I know email stars, cause I've taken it goes in depth and has a mm -hmm. lot of good nuggets in there, but like, what are some of the low hanging fruit that people, the mistakes or the myths or whatever that you could just kind of pop, pop, pop for us? Well, the first thing is just consistency. Like it seems so basic, but for those of your listeners who haven't just achieved a basic level of consistency, which could be every two weeks or even every week, like that is the most important thing and will make the most dramatic difference in the long term. Like email can be short game. Like, yes, you can do 48 hour promos and make money quickly when you have a well nurtured email list. However, like it really is long game. And in this world, like in online business, so much of the marketing that we see is very much about like get it fast like this strategy tomorrow like seven figure business this year like fast 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 and i think that email marketing is really for people who um like i just want to encourage people to think about it as like something that will benefit your business 
in the long term, like, and it will just grow and grow and grow. So consistency is the most important thing if you really want to leverage that long term growth. And I would say the second thing, um, I'll just say one more thing when it comes to selling, like actually just sending more emails, like that can be uncomfortable for people who haven't mailed very often. And it's uncomfortable because the more you mail, the more you see people unsubscribe. However, like people do need more touch points most of the time. And it can take a number of emails to address all of the objections you need to address and just like get people to wake up and realize you're selling something because they might have missed the first three times you said it. And then also that this there is a special sale on or it's not happening forever. Like that does take time and that could apply to a promo sequence, but it also could apply to like, you know, in the past, I would send like one or two webinar invitations if I was doing a webinar and that was it. And now I'm like, okay, well, the webinar, like that, that's how I get people into the whole promotion. So I got to put like way more focus on that. So um, sending more emails in, you know, when you have something to offer and in general, just sending them consistently. The, the, um, the statistic you said before about the 49% of people want to see you in their inbox. Yes. I think that if people could marry that statistic with the piece that you just said of showing up more, but you, if you think you're being a pain in the ass by showing up in somebody's inbox, this is your big block, right? But Tarzan is saying 49% Mm -hmm. of people want more of those touch points. And so you, you're never going to be more consistent if you still think you're a pain in the ass in people's inbox. So really leaning into that 49% Mm -hmm. is like, I think that's a super helpful number to kind of like put on a post-it note and remind Mm -hmm. yourself every time you're putting out an email. I love that. Thank you for, I I didn't know that. That's amazing. Um, One of the things I really wanted to talk about today is how, you know, consistency and all of the stuff that we've been talking about, my whole platform is like, it has to be sustainable. It has to be realistic and it has to be non-bullshitty. So how does email stars, which I know is coming this summer, um, how does like that help us do everything with email with more ease? What are some of the big takeaways from email stars? Well, okay. So opens June 9th, by the way. And um, this program, like this is our seventh time promoting this program, launching and selling this program. And it's evolved a lot over the years. And in those years, like I've gone from like using every persuasion strategy that I could think of to being a lot more intentional about how I promote and what sort of some things I'm willing and not willing to do in terms of applying pressure to the sale. So um, a lot of that's been built into the program, but actually right from the beginning, like one of the things I feel really proud of in our program is it's always been like, here are like, here's, you know, a very systematized way to do email from the time that someone joins your email list what to do next, how to write weekly nurture emails, like how to sell things, how to get people on webinars, how to get people booking calls, onboarding people to your programs, all those sorts of things. Like we go through the entire customer journey Mm -hmm. and also the program's very non-linear. Like people will, um, people will sign up and start by watching module five, which is all about sales because they just need that. Um, And then they'll go back when they're ready for nurturing or like, it's like something that you can really skip around. And it's also very much like, here's what works. And here, like, if you only do one thing, do this thing. And something I say all the time is like, just look for the 10% because email marketing is something that you really can build on. And you don't have to, I've never really, well, I've followed a lot of people's systems. I've never felt like people necessarily needed to do exactly what I need to do. Um, and it's mostly like nurturing is really important. Here's how to do it. Here's how to format your emails. Um, here's like, you know, all of the logistical stuff, tagging and segmenting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, here are the must do's and here are like all the other things you could do based on the type of business you want to do, how you want to sell, what strategies you feel comfortable selling. Like, do you use upsells, downsells, cross sells? Here's how to do those. And um, it's really like a choose your own adventure kind of program. And I think that's incredibly important because 
what I want the most from my students is that they really find the joy in their email marketing and really learn to just love the process. Because if they love it, then that's, then they're going to keep doing it. And if they keep doing it, then they were, they, then they will really start making money from it. Yeah. I wanted to really encourage people to check out email stars. So I have a program called the content creator studio where it's a membership where people every week get content support, but I'm not an email. Like I don't want to be, I don't want to go deep into emails. Cause like you've said today, there's obviously so many uh, avenues you can go with emails, welcome emails, nurture emails, selling emails, webinar emails, sales. Like there's so much. And mm. I don't want to be the Oracle for email. And part of why I really wanted to have you on was that if people really want to go deep and wide on email, this program is a really great program. And it, and you have it in your, on your computer for the rest of your life. You can go back, you get the updates, like Tarzan <laughs> updates things. She's very generous with that. And so I really want to say to the people listening, if email is a thing that you have really kind of said, like, I suck at this and I don't know how to do it, like go buy this program. It's accessible and you, you have a live component to it, right, Tarzan? Yeah, definitely. There's about 12 weeks of support with yeah. the program and um, it's really hands-on. And there's one thing that people really love, like some of our power users have logged in like more than 150 times <laughs> because time. um, we, yeah, we have like swipe files for everything. So mm -hmm. sample emails, like those things, those are, a pe not everybody uses them, honestly. Some people don't like swipe files. Um, but having samples of like, here's how this, here's how it was done in the past. And, um, that just tends to make things go so much faster. Like it's, it gives like, it gives, just gets the ball rolling. So anyway, that's my, that's my plug for emails to stars. I'm not getting paid to say that. So I just really believe in this program, especially if you really want to go deep and wide on email. Um, I have another question for you though, and it's kind of a little bit out of this lane, which is one of the things I've watched you do over the past two years is really dive into um, kind of looking at your marketing practices, deciding what feels good for you, what doesn't feel good to you, really start to be transparent with your audience, kind of in an effort to break down some of the um, bullshitty stuff, the bro marketing stuff, the overt promises that we see that have become the norm in the industry. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, um, well, I'd love to hear your evolution about how you came to this decision to kind of put the brakes on and say, I'm going to do this a different way. Yeah, well, I, at a certain point, like, you know, I've used all the strategies, everything that I was taught and made lots of money doing it. And mm -hmm. along the way, I just sort of ignored or rationalized why some people were getting results and other people weren't. Mm -hmm. um, and of course that's business. Like not everybody will be successful in the businesses that they start. And I, I do understand that's normal. However, I just sensed like a lot of people had resistance to doing things like fast action bonuses and countdown timers and, um, you Value know, all stacking. like, and value stacking, like valued at $8,000 yeah. today, only 500, like all these things. Like, I mean, I started to find them a bit cliche, but also I just felt enormous resistance. And I also observed people, um, buying like panic buying, yeah. buying because they just wanted to, they were just in an enormous amount of discomfort. Maybe they were already in discomfort or maybe because some promotion they looked at was making them feel like they were not going to be successful unless they bought this thing. Like I've seen that style of marketing over and over and over where it's like, if you are serious about your business, you must invest in yourself. And, you know, how do you want to feel when you wake up tomorrow? Like, are you going to buy this product or are you just going to go back? To, are you just going to be satisfied with the way your life is? Like just so much of that messaging that felt really manipulative. And, you know, I never said things like that. However, I wrote them for clients and um, I just got to a point where I kind of had enough mm -hmm. and I had to do things differently. And I, even in my, it, it showed up in other ways. Like I 
just felt like I was promoting all the time. And I didn't put that much effort into creating my own courses. I was just constantly selling, constantly selling other people's things and constantly, you know, talking about how this thing was going to make someone rich or this thing. And, um, you know, along the time at that time, I also was like, sort of having an awakening in terms of like my um like understanding that I hold these dominant identities as someone who is white and cisgender um you know English speaking beautiful charismatic all these things I was like oh so I started to put it together that like maybe why some of this stuff was really working for me and not others was because of some of these layers of privilege that I hold and me going and telling people if I can do it you can do it too is like not really fair Mm. and not actually acknowledging that in many ways I had a head start Mm. and so I mean that really just kind of shredded my whole world and I had to think about not just marketing, but everything differently. And it's been, you know, years, two and a half years now of trying to figure out what sort of marketing makes sense for me and what I feel good about. And it's real. initially, I was just wanting people to say, this is good. This is bad. Do this. Don't do that. And along the way, I really realized like, it's me, it's only me that can like make those intentional choices about like, do I use countdown timers? Do I not? Will I maybe use a fast action bonus for this product, but not for this one over here? Like just thinking about these things and um, making the choices that are right for my business and my customers, rather than just using every strategy, because that's what someone told me I had to do in order to be successful. And in making these changes in my mark, the students who come into my programs are actually like really ready for them and really wanting them um, as opposed to people that just buy and then fall off the map because they never really wanted it in the first place. They just found the marketing so convincing that they ended up there. Yeah. Or they didn't have um, like capacity for it. Like they never really were going to have mm-hmm. the yes. uh, ability to move through it. Um so when you right. were kind of shredding everything and rebuilding it and assessing, um, I know that it, bit by watching your emails, I know that there's a lot of vulnerability that comes through because your stuff is so story-based and you were going through such an enormous transformation. How did you protect yourself? And I'm also going to ask you, how do you protect your audience for in, in being so vulnerable with them? So I have had to learn how to have hard conversations in email marketing and, and in all places. And initially, like anytime I said something controversial and people didn't like it, I just would instantly be like totally like central nervous system, completely out of whack and just wanting to like hide under my desk and say, sorry, and never speak to anyone again. I have had to learn and find strategies to self-regulate and also really get clear on what I believe in and who I am and what strategies I'm comfortable using. I have had to grow. And I think being a business owner is like ultimately one of the most profound like exercises in personal growth that there are. <laughs> and so like it was hard in the beginning and I think it is for everyone and having support is helpful having like I have a team that I can talk things through but for other people that might be you know having like a peer group that you can have conversations with um so that support is really important and um especially as you're trying to figure out like who you are in the world and what your business is really doing um that can take time to come through and in the early days like getting critical feedback sometimes like especially for people who are marginalized or people who have like a lot of trauma like or just like I just would automatically think like I am so bad I just have to quit um so building that strength and resilience within myself and and realizing, and this took time, like, what do I need to take responsibility for? And what is not mine? Like now, when an email comes in, that's highly critical of something that I wrote, 
I'm pretty good at reading it and seeing like, oh, that's your stuff. Mm. And in many cases too, I'm like, oh yes, there's something that I really didn't think of. And we could talk about that. And, and just coming to understand, like some people will attack you in email that does happen. Um, but sometimes people just want to give feedback and it can feel like an attack when it isn't an attack. So um, all of that is really like, it's learned over time. It requires, like, I think email is a really brave space. And um, I think, you know, just like with the writing, like you get better at it by doing it, by doing it <laughs> consistently. Have you had to do anything to consider your audience uh, when you are being super vulnerable with them? Yeah, I mean, like if I'm, if I'm, um, you know, talking about like abuse or Kanye West or, um, you know, there's some subjects that I will put like content notes at the top so yeah, that, yeah. because I know that I have subscribers who will find the topic triggering. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I like to have content notes, not all the, it's like pretty rare, but I do do that. And also my team generally reads all of the replies before I do. And I understand I'm fortunate. I have a team that can do that, but that is like, that has been helpful, especially in times when I was just really like, um, going through a lot and I just needed like it, like, I think like, let's say you're checking your own email and you've sent something that you think could be a little bit polarizing even just like taking a few breaths and like going into the space in a grounded place, like where I've gotten hurt um, and where it's been hard is when I just like got, I just went to like check my email right before a call. And like, there was this bomb in there that yeah. I wasn't prepared for at all. So, you know, even just like setting aside time now I do it every Friday. I read email mm. replies and I know there's going to be all different types of replies in there and I'm ready for it. And I have time set aside for it. Love it. Tarzan, thank you so much. How can people get into your orbit and how can they find email stars? Okay. So right now we're running a series of workshops called the email workshops, which you can find at the email workshops.com. Um, there's also a Facebook group that goes with it. It's a whole like three week long event. The group opens on May 16th. And then we have workshops on how to do welcome emails. We have workshops on email metrics, and I have another workshop on storytelling. So that's happening throughout the end of May. And then email stars opens on June 9th. Um, so you can go to tarzank.com. All the information will be there. There'll be a link there or join the email workshops. I think that's a really great place to start and hang out with my crew, meet my team and learn about email. It's a really fun series of workshops. We, um, it's like interactive. There's no slide deck. I'm teaching from a Google doc and you can like copy the doc and follow along and get some writing done and like really get going on your email marketing. If it's a goal you have for this year. I will drop those links in the show notes and in the everything else I send out about this. How can people follow you on Instagram? Where are you on Instagram? I'm Tarzan underscore K. I'm also sporadically on LinkedIn, but more so on Instagram and my stories. Thank you so much for all your gems and your time and your expertise and for going to all the places I needed to go today to have this great interview. Thank you so much, Tarzan. Thanks, Jen. Bye everyone.